Welcome to episode four of the Beyond the Guitar podcast, where we help you play the music you love and where we talk all things guitar and beyond. I'm Nathan Mills, joined by my co-host, Jeremiah Diaz. And uh, today, Jeremiah and I have been kind of geeking out. I know we talked a couple episodes back about how we were excited for uh, Streets of Rage 4 coming out. And uh, it did, in fact, come out. And, uh, and we've been playing it. And, and it's, it's just such fan service. I think it's just such a perfect tribute to that old school side scroller fighter arcade style game. How have you been digging it, Jeremiah? Uh, man, it's pretty cool. The, the music is awesome. The animation is awesome. The gameplay is like, they've, they improved on the gameplay from before. Uh, I love it. I think the only thing that I wanted was a uh, a, mo- a modernized uh, version of Skate, but you know, I'm I'm guessing they'll save that for Street of Rage Five or something, right? And that's of course that's one of the characters. It's kind of a niche conversation subject, I guess for <laughs> for old school Street oh, yeah, of Skate. Rage fans. Yeah, Skate. Yeah, Skate's one of the characters. Yeah, but yeah, they, I think they let you like they let you do like a retro. Like they let you choose the retro sprites. So it's like y- you can play him. But he's all pixelated and stuff, right? But, um, and yeah. and other than that, man, it's awesome. That's one thing that we talked about this briefly um, on the phone the other day. But I wanted to kind of ask you about the music specifically because that's one thing that we were looking forward to. Because talking about the the n- nostalgia aspect that we were referencing a couple episodes ago, uh, we were looking forward to hearing some of that original music and seeing what we did with what they did with the new soundtrack. So since that's kind of more your realm of, you know, expertise, I guess the, the style of music that they're doing in there, what, what's your impression on like how they, how they maybe iterated on what they did before, what they changed, how they were true to the original. What are your thoughts on that? Oh man, I thought it was perfect. Um, it's like a, a blend of like, uh, you know, I think I said this before, like, uh, techno hip hop now, and they, they got like deep house in there now. And like, uh, some modern touches of like EDM and stuff. Um, but, uh, I, I thought it was great. I, I think one of my favorite parts in the game so far is when, uh, they have a music cue for, you know, those, those policemen with the shields. Oh yeah. I hate those guys. I know. As soon as it, as soon as you see the first one in the, in the jail, they turn it on. It's like, brown, 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 brown. <laughs> and then and then as soon as they turn it on it's like anyway it's cool it's yeah, got nice. like sirens and stuff yeah um we had to play it a few times because we uh my brother and i kept dying but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough those, so those I, old school arcade figured, games man they didn't mess around yeah i figured out that they they had a music cue in there it's pretty cool yeah well that that's neat i didn't pick up on that but that's what uh jeremiah and i were talking about um on on the phone earlier was like that's that would be such a tough job anytime um like stepping into the any type of music role related to this where you know the fans are expecting something but they also don't want you to just kind of copy and paste what you did before they want something different but that's also recognizable and true to the original um navigating that like i I really don't envy (laughs) <laughs> the people that were responsible for doing that. It's such a tough job. Yeah. They, they brought the original composer back, I think for a few of the songs and they brought a bunch of other artists to like collaborate on it. So yeah, man, they pulled it off. I thought it was really good. Um, my, it's like my brother said, he's like, man, sometimes you just got to give the people what they want. And right. I feel like that's exactly, exactly what they did with Street Rage 4. So it's a, uh, it was, it was cool. I, I like, I, I love playing it. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, it's a good time. Um, but we wanted to use that as a springboard into what we wanted to talk about today, which was um, musical challenges that we've both experienced throughout our uh, careers and our journeys as musicians and how we kind of overcame those various challenges. Um, I know uh, it's been... It's been, even with just beyond the guitar, I feel like it's been a very long road um, with lots of kind of ups and downs. And and it was, 
it was kind of nice as I was planning out what we were going to talk about today, kind of thinking back on all these, all these hurdles, um, you know, a lot of which are, are things that I'm still working on. Um, but a lot of them are things that I have been able to improve on and, and overcome. And so it's kind of, it was kind of therapeutic, I feel like to kind of reflect back on that, but I wanted to start out kind of chronologically and go back to some of my first memories of some of the biggest challenges that I first faced in uh, college as a classical guitar major. Um, so for me, the first thing that came to mind is my first college performance, the first student recital that I had to do. Um, up until that point, we had talked about this in the first episode where we you know, Jeremiah and I were in a, a band together in high school. And so, you know, we performed a lot of gigs and talent shows and things like that to where um, I felt like I got nervous in high school, but I don't remember ever really being super anxious. I don't know. Do you remember that differently, Jeremiah? Did, I mean, did, was I like a mess before concerts? Because I feel like I was fine. Yeah, no, I don't remember you being super nervous. I think I think you were uh, you were satisfied just hiding behind your hair. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, the long <laughs> hair that I was able to just it. like is a coping mechanism. <laughs> yeah, and then the same thing for me since I was behind the drum, so I felt I felt shielded from the audience. That's true. And, well, and so, uh, what what yeah, what I felt like it was uh, because that's what I was leading into is this first performance in college. I was freaking out. Um, and I was so, so nervous. And I think the biggest difference was, uh, my hair was shorter. Yes. So I, I didn't have that, uh, that to protect me. Um, no, actually no back. No, the, for that performance, I still had the long hair to hide behind, no, but, but it didn't no, help me. No, I think, I think, weren't you wearing a ponytail? Uh, I mean, I think you had the long hair. I think it was just in a ponytail. Maybe it was, I don't remember. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we don't talk about your, the ponytail uh, though. <laughs> I'm about pretty that. sure. I, I don't know if it was a requirement or what, but I'm pretty sure every single uh, performance I ever saw you do in uh, college. Of course, I was never there live. I I was watching it later, but I'm pretty sure you had a ponytail hmm. and for all of your classical guitar performances. Yeah, he head banging was frowned upon. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I was I was freaking out, brooding and, in the shadows, right? Well, whilst playing your <laughs> Johann your Sebastian Bach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the biggest difference was that I, it was me solo. That was what, what freaked me out the most is that in high school, it was always, there's that kind of sense of camaraderie in a band to where the buck doesn't stop with you, right? If I screw up, I know that the show will kind of still go on and I'll be able to jump back in and, you know, potentially hide behind, you know, the, the rest of the band and <laughs> until I can get my act together. Um, but as a solo classical guitarist, I was up there and it's a different environment. Like the, the audience isn't making any noise, right? The, the culture of these classical concerts is that they sit there in absolute silence as you walk out on stage, you know, you take your awkward bow, you sit down uh, and then and you perform. And I, I just remember being backstage freaking out and it was a student recital where we all took turns just going up playing one piece and some of the upperclassmen were kind of trying to give me some encouragement and they were talking about their <laughs> I remember one guy he was like yeah my first concert I was so freaked out I ended up playing the whole song with one finger <laughs> <laughs> how, does and, uh, even, how does that even work I, I can't <laughs> imagine I can't imagine that it went well <laughs> but and so that was a little bit encouraging, but when I went out on stage, sure enough, my hands were shaking, kind of all the textbook fight or flight symptoms of, of performance anxiety, and I had to play. I was so mad at my my professor back then because he had me playing. It's a, it's a Villa Lobos uh, prelude for those uh, classical guitarists listening, um, I forget, I think it's number four, where there's this like crazy ascending arpeggio section where you just go all the way up the neck. And with shaking fingers, that's like nearly impossible. So it was, it was a terrible first performance. Um, but that was kind of a, a recurring theme throughout my first 
you know, few, a couple of years of college was every time I had a performance, it was like dealing with that performance anxiety. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. Um, did you, uh, get any advice or anything from your, uh, instructors or like, like encouraging or like, Hey, it's a, you know, better luck next time or anything like that. Or was it just, <laughs> I don't remember what feedback he gave me for that first, that first recital. I think, he probably recognized my kind of fragile emotional state. And so he was probably more playing to the like, no, I was great. You know, you did a good job. Um, <laughs> so I think he was being sensitive to that. Uh, but oh man, dude, that reminds me of uh, uh, what you mentioned, not being able to uh, like kind of hide behind your band or, or whatever. Like, you know, if one person messes up in a band, it's not a huge deal because you just keep going. Right. That, there was one show that I did with, with a band that I was in, uh, in college, um, and we were playing at this venue for the first time, I think. But th- there's this, there was this tricky part in the song where the fill comes in on like an offbeat, and like it's like it was like very uh, hard time. So like everybody was like synced to that fill. Yeah, and I I totally messed up. I I like came in on the wrong beat, and like everybody looked at me like what What are you doing? And then and then we like tried to keep going and it just completely fell apart <laughs> like uh, no. we had to stop the song uh, we had that's to stop my the literal song nightmare, like yeah uh dude, it was the it was <laughs> the worst thing in the world we had to stop like maybe like a minute into the song and we like started over i don't know if we started over or if we started like a, a few seconds or like you know 30 seconds back or whatever but i just remember feeling like the worst after that but uh um, yeah well that's what i i, I, yeah. I, I gotta get over it i know right? i don't because it was like the middle of the set so like right. I, we had to keep playing so <laughs> he's just not gonna like well we'll throw in the <laughs> yeah, towel guess, yeah, we're, yeah i'm, I'm out <laughs> man I, I gotta go home uh, yeah yeah i i don't envy you as a drummer for that because you definitely don't have that same ability to kind of hide behind the rest of the band as the drummer you know really it is like, yeah, if, if you fall apart as a guitarist, if, if things fall apart for me, I can kind of lean on if there's another guitarist or, you know, yeah. even the drummer to keep things going. But if you fall apart, it's kind of, it's kind of over. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's, and it's so weird. Cause like, I'm, I'm like, I'm not that, I'm not an amazing drummer. I can like keep a beat and stuff. Um, but like, it's weird. You'll be playing like, uh, like on stage or whatever, like, you know, for a gig or whatever and like you'll know the song and it'll be something that you're totally comfortable with and for whatever reason like your mind starts drifting and then i'll be like oh there's a thing coming up and it's like oh wait no there there it went like that's i was supposed to play it <laughs> like two like a measure ago or whatever and i'm like ah oh, crap like <laughs> i just messed up and uh but most of the time people don't notice except for that you know except for the time when the entire band stopped i'm like right you know i felt like diving in a ditch somewhere but <laughs> <laughs> yeah just sticking your head in the sand yeah yeah so i think you know and i think it would be interesting to talk about performance anxiety in an episode in and of itself um so i won't go into too much detail right now as far as how i learned to 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 cope with that uh but the the biggest thing that i kind of learned about that throughout my undergrad was just uh, sticking with it, you know, not giving up, which is of course going to be a recurring theme throughout a lot of these challenges. A lot of it boils down to just like powering through showing up again next time. It gets a little bit easier. Um, and, and that consistency and that perseverance and with performance, you know, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, but I did find that, you know, some of those symptoms of performance anxiety have never gone away for me. It affects everybody differently. I remember being really pissed off at some of my classmates who just, they have those personalities to where they don't care in a sense, right? They don't really care about what other people think and they don't care about if it goes poorly, they know the sun's still going to rise the next day. And that, you know, trickles into their performance to where they can go up there and perform and not be anxious at all and uh, and have a real easy performance and I always hated that because it I would you know that classic thing that everybody's experienced where you prepare 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 you can you know totally shred it in the practice room and then you go up on stage and you tank um, but so for me um, I still if I go up and perform I still have certain symptoms like the the shaky hands have gone away you know I was able to learn how to 
deal with that and, and minimize that. But for me, it's the, the fight or flight blood rushing out of, out of my hands to where my hands turn cold. Uh, that still to this day happens. And so the big kind of my essentially, I guess we could say victory there. I don't know. Cause this is an ongoing thing, but kind of what I've learned from that is to really settle into those nerves and relax into them and know that it's, uh, it's okay. And it's not going to just because you're feeling those things doesn't mean you are doomed to a terrible performance. Cause that's what, you know, in those first performances, as soon as those, those nerves started making my hands shake and, and getting my hands cold, I would be like, Oh, it's, it's already over. Like, I know I'm going to screw up and be terrible, but you can play through those things as you learn to relax and just recognize them as, you know, it's just your body's natural reaction to this scary environment. Um, yeah. Is it any different now that you're more in front of a microphone and like a camera? Is it, is it different than playing in front of an audience? Yeah, that's really, it's really different. Um, I, it's a different kind of nerves. Um, a lot of people experience this as well. The first time they hit the record button, I have a lot of students in the arrangers Academy, um, that I have that are, are kind of starting making their own videos for the first time. And they're commenting on like, you know, I can play it perfectly, but as soon as I see that red record light on, I screw up. And, and so it yeah, is it's all garbage, right? Yeah. So it's, a, it's still, you, you still have to have that performance mindset. Um, and it's a good way to practice for live performances. Cause it does get you in that headspace. But again, it's one of those things I do that so much now that I still have to get into that mindset, but it's the pressure is always going to be less. Cause I know I can still, you know, hit stop and, and do another, do another take. Um, so for me, yeah. because I perform live less now, that is something that, you know, I gave a concert in front of, um, it was like 4,000 people or something this past, uh, year at this big event. And yeah, the nerves hit me pretty hard cause I've been out of that, out of that zone for a while. Oh man. Just imagine if you'd uh, done a live concert for all the kids that have seen your Fortnite videos, <laughs> like 13 million or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I can't imagine maybe what, maybe not that high. I don't remember. I can't imagine what, what that concert would look like. Just a bunch of kids <laughs> jumping up on stage doing the floss. Uh, but that's actually that, that concert that I gave uh, this past year, that was kind of a nightmare scenario in and of itself because I was, I was reading off of an iPad because I, I, I didn't have all the music memorized, so I was just going to use the iPad. And I actually had to lead the audience in an arrangement of the national anthem where I play a solo arrangement of it on the guitar and the audience sings along. And right before it was my time to go up, I sat down on stage, hit my iPad, and my music wouldn't come up. It said I didn't have access to the cloud or whatever. And <laughs> so I realized oh, no. I hadn't saved the the music to the iPad itself. It was just in the cloud, and I didn't have a connection in there for some reason, even though I did earlier with the sound check. I guess with all those people in there, there wasn't enough... I don't know, bandwidth or whatever. And yeah. so I was freaking out, you know, trying to figure out what, because I hadn't memorized the national anthem. Like, how am I going to fake my way through playing the national anthem for, for all these people? Oh, man. Um, so, yeah. It's like, it's like all those uh, stars that try and sing the national anthem and they forget the lyrics. Right. Yeah, exactly. Not, although, probably, I can't, I can't imagine anything was worse than uh, Fergie at the All Star game. I think it was like 2017. Did you uh, see that? I do remember that. Yeah, vaguely. Oh man, that is the funniest thing. <laughs> do that. <laughs> anyway, it's like sorry. A, so how to go? It's like a rite of passage to just butcher the national <laughs> yeah, anthem. To, to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Long story short, I just had to walk off stage and like get these people to help me, like get the Wi-Fi password, and then the Wi-Fi wouldn't work, and <laughs> oh, then like no. <laughs> it, it took me like five minutes of turning it off and on again, and finally it worked and. It, it all worked out, but that was not a good recipe for like going into a performance uh, in a calm state of mind. Cause after that I was just all revved up. It took me a while to settle down after that, like 
imagining the worst case scenario of trying to wing the national anthem for 4,000 people. Oh, man. <laughs> Moral of the story, kids, memorize your music. Yeah. No, but that reminds me, I have dreams all the time that I'll be doing a gig somewhere with the, with the band and my drum set will be all over the stage. So like my snare will be like on one side of the stage and my kick drum will be on the other <laughs> side and my cymbal will be, and I'll be, I'm like running and I'm literally running around trying to hit all the drums at the right time. Oh my God. I have the, I have those kinds of dreams relatively frequently. It's really weird. That's hilarious. I, I wonder it. if that's like a, a, a common dream for drummers, you know, like everybody has that, you know, showing up to school with no clothes on kind of dream. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's the yeah, drummer's I have nightmare. I have talked to, I have talked to one buddy of mine who's a drummer who said he's had similar dreams. But that's oh, that's dude. funny. Yeah, performance anxiety has been has been a big challenge. Kind of working through overcoming that. Um, I remember another. This was kind of an interesting, unintentional victory over those nerves. Uh, one time, I went back to. VCU, my alma mater, to to play a featured alumni concert. And you'll appreciate this, Jeremiah. I I don't know if I've told you this. I was backstage waiting to go on because it was a split set between myself uh, and another uh, alum, alumnus. And while I was waiting for my turn to go on, even though I was back there feeling, you know, the usual kind of nerves and uh, kind of adrenaline of, of getting ready to perform, I, uh, I fell asleep backstage <laughs> and, and, uh, like Jeremiah. So, uh, so aptly pointed out, and I think it was the first episode, I'm basically borderline narcoleptic to where I can fall asleep, uh, at a drop of a pen. It's weird. The only thing you don't fall asleep for is video games pretty much yeah, in my I, experience. I, I found in my, and, and, and apparently work. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, work usually keeps me up. Video games, it, it does kind of depend on the game. I found maybe it's my my old age that I'm starting to pass out sometimes in the middle of a video game too, and I wake up like walking into a wall. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so I fell asleep and oh, literally man. woke up as they were calling me on, <laughs> which which you would think would be a recipe for really freaking out because I was like, you know, coming out of this sleep and like, it's, it's time to, time to turn, turn on and perform. But, uh, I, I went out on stage and that was like the best performance I've ever given because I, I realized <laughs> it's like my body didn't have the opportunity to get all worked up and all those, you know, the blood rushing out of my hands and all that stuff. Like I went on, you know, this the, on stage and my hands were warm and, um, I just felt totally ready to go. So I've kind of, uh, chased that feeling oh, ever since I got it. It's just like when we recorded our, our album way back in, that's you know, right. before, before we parted ways in high school, sleeping you know, is my fall asleep. superpower, <laughs> fall asleep, do a take, fall asleep. Yeah. Do a take. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like the, I'd be like the lamest superhero. But my power is the, <laughs> the ability to fall asleep anywhere and everywhere. And if I happen to have to perform right after that, it'll be awesome. Well, that would that would that would make for some very uh, unique uh, abilities. Yeah, I wonder what kind of situation you have to drop for that if you were a comic book writer. <laughs> yeah, uh, that just would not be very exciting. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sleep, man. Sleep, man. Oh my god, <laughs> this is the stupidest uh, thing. Yeah, <laughs> be a Z list, <laughs> Z list superhero. Oh man. Um, so that was, yeah, a recurring thing throughout my, my college career is really overcoming those nerves. Um, and then a, a big twist for my senior recital, uh, about a month before my recital, I was really revving up my practice to make sure that I could, of course, nail the recital. It's a big deal. And so I was practicing, you know, upwards of five hours a day, um, you know, there are some people who practice more than that and are, are, are nuts, but I was revving up to about five hours a day and I started to get some serious pain in my hands and in my wrists that, um, you know, as a guitarist, you always hear about tendonitis and carpal tunnel and you hear these nightmare stories uh, about some serious cases where people literally can't play anymore. And so I saw the warning signs of that 
and it started to, you know, I'd feel pain when I would put pressure on the strings and leading up to my, you know, biggest moment of my career at this point, my senior recital, this was like the worst timing for that to happen. And so, yeah, I remember we talked about it way back when, and I was like really worried for you, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was really scary. And I kind of had to make a judgment call. It was that mental battle between, I I knew that I've got this recital in, in 30 days. I had already, I think at the time I'd already been accepted into my grad school. So uh, maybe it was a contingent. I don't remember how it worked, but there wasn't really any pushing back this senior recital. And, um, and so I had this decision, basically, I could try to push through this for the sake of really nailing this recital, but at the risk of potentially permanently damaging my hands, or I could take it easy and not push it and not practice as much, uh, if at all, and, you know, let my hands heal up, but potentially bomb my recital. And um, I decided to take it easy because I didn't want to do anything that would risk my long-term ability to play. Um, so that was, it was a really scary time in my career because uh, I was, of course, uncertain about how, what this would mean for my future. And then in the short term, I was uncertain about how I was going to play this recital, especially since I still had those, that performance anxiety and everything as well. And so what I did to kind of help overcome that um, was I focused on what I could control. So I made the decision that I, I wasn't going to really practice very much. So what I could control was I could make sure that my memory of these pieces was rock solid. Um, so I would literally sit there, close my eyes, run through my whole set, about an hour long set, just as if watching myself play. So I wasn't physically playing, but I was watching myself play through it. Um, that's always the final test that I do for my memory to make sure that I really know it, that it's beyond just muscle memory. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's so locked into my mind that I can play through it all without a guitar even in my hands. And, and that gives you, I recommend that as a final step for people's memory as well, because it gives you that confidence in your memory, which is a big deal, even beyond just the memory itself. Uh, because lots of times we have something memorized, but when you go up on stage to perform, you doubt that memory and that in and of itself leads to memory slips. Um, So yeah, I really focused on just locking down my memory so that I knew even if I maybe had to struggle through some of the physical aspects, uh, that my mental game was going to be really strong for the recital. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, by the time the recital came, my hands still hadn't really completely healed. uh, But I, I powered through and by, you know, God's grace, it, it went, well, I mean, there's there's still videos somewhere <laughs> online on YouTube, if you dig deep um, on another channel of of some of those performances, and um, it, it it turned out really well. And I was able that the summer after that to kind of heal up my hands the rest of the way. Um, so so yeah, but that was that was a scary moment. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine being in like a classical. Uh, grade uh performance especially solo because that's i feel like that's so intense because all the stuff that i've been a part of it's all been like as far as performance goes it's all been fairly casual so even if you screw up (laughs) or you have to restart a song it's like you're not you know you're not like uh your career isn't on the line you know what i mean right oh dude that that's uh that's nerve-wracking yeah it really takes it's a whole nother level of focus that you have to that you have to get into tuning out your kind of own inner voices, you know, of doubt and distractions and tuning out any external distractions and yeah. really leaning on your own preparation. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. That's, that kind of reminds me of like for myself when I'm doing work for somebody else, usually uh, as far as like writing compositions, I, I used to be really intimidated or like scared that I would write something and not so much that they wouldn't like it, like the client, 
but more I'd have fear that I wouldn't like my own stuff. So like that was a huge block for me before where like I would, I would fear that I would write something and I wouldn't be able to achieve what I had in my mind or I achieve right. what I, the standard that I had in my head. <clears throat> and so that's something I've really worked on is uh, getting past that block of like fearing that my, that I won't even like what I'm, you know, it's that whole like self-loathing thing that you talked about way back uh, a couple episodes where I feel like most artists uh, or musicians or whatever feel that where it's like, ah, oh, I, I write something and it's like, I don't know if this is good. It's, it's probably terrible. I don't know if anyone will like it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think anybody who has, you know, if you hold yourself to a high standard, you're always going to wrestle with that to some extent, I think, because to be honest, I, I face that a little bit with every new arrangement I make. There's there's a little bit of an intimidation factor every time I start a new arrangement, uh, not only for my own internal expectations, like what you're talking about, where you know I want to be proud of this when it's when it's done. Am I gonna be able to, especially if it's something that doesn't seem like I don't I can't initially conceptualize how it's going to play out on the guitar some things just really flow and, and it comes really quickly and it just works well from the beginning but some things I have to really wrestle with and then I have that same doubt and then I also have that the doubt of the external pressure where I feel like you know I've put out arrangements in the past that I'm proud of and that I feel like people have come to expect of me um, and so I'm always like I, I feel that external pressure to like, is this is this arrangement going to be the one that really disappoints myself and my audience? And and so yeah, I, that is kind of a, a constant thing that we we wrestle with. Yeah, it's scary. One of the things that I uh, worked on was a a piece for a, a video game company that was uh, potentially going to use my services, but like it didn't it didn't work out. But like I was so proud of the thing that I made, and I'll show a clip of it later. But, um, or, or let people hear a clip of it later. But, um, yeah, I, that was, a, I think that was a, a kind of a milestone for me in terms of, uh, like the fear and anxiety of like writing something for myself or for other people is that like what, when that piece of music was rejected, I was like, well, I'm happy with it. Like I'm happy with what I produced and it just didn't fit what they were looking for. And, you know, so be it. So, uh, yeah, that was a that was a a big a big uh, hurdle for me. Yeah, well, why don't? But I but I was able to get over it, thankfully. So right for the, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know we're always tweaking and and fine tuning how we respond to these kind of things. But yeah, it's like it's like a seesaw, you know. Right. Well, why don't you? Um, can you dive into that a little bit now? I mean, I think sure. So basically, uh, one of my buddies from college. Uh, got a job at a video game company doing sound design um, called Cryptic Studios. It's in uh, it's in Los Gatos. It's, no one knows where that is. Anyway, it's it's like in the Bay Area where, where I live. And um, uh, basically I was like, hey, like, you know, are there any gigs open or any jobs available? Because um, I'm like not wanting to stay at my current job. And uh, he was like, actually, yeah, they're, they're uh, making a new patch uh, for this game called Neverwinter and we need music for like these scenarios and uh anyway long story short i sent a piece of music over that uh the description when i read it uh reminded me a lot of uh like mad max fury road uh the 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 characters that the music was supposed to be for and what the vibe was supposed to be right uh that's what it reminded me of so i asked uh, my buddy he's like hey it's it kind of sounds like the mad max fury road soundtrack would fit this is that accurate and he said yeah so I was like, okay, so I'll kind of go for that. And he's like, yeah, that's a really good uh, baseline. So um, I'll just share a clip of it right now, and this is what I came up with. So that's just a short clip of it. 
Um, you can actually listen to the whole thing on YouTube. I put it on my YouTube channel. So if you just look for Jeremiah Dias, that's with an S, <laughs> D-I-A-S, and then the the name, I just called it Fury because I didn't know what else to call it. Um, Jeremiah Dias Fury on YouTube. You can listen to the whole thing if you want to. But um, Yeah, that's so sick. I love that. Uh- I love the, uh, it's just, it, it feels like such a classic boss fight tune and all the, <laughs> all the, all the percussion. And, uh, yeah, I remember when you sent that to me back when, uh, all this was going on, it's, it's just yeah. so, so sick. It hits so hard. Thanks, man. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I was pretty proud of it. I, I hadn't done a final mix at the time. So what you hear on YouTube is a final mix of it. Um, I actually did that for this podcast because I was like, I I need to finish this thing, just get it out there. But um, yeah, so there was no final mix of it, but uh, I sent it to my buddy and I was like, hey man, do you think, uh, what what do you think of this? And um, he basically told me that what his boss would be looking for would be something different and it wouldn't really work for what his boss was looking for. And so he didn't, basically to like make sure I didn't, in case something, some other opportunity came up down the line, he didn't want to present it to his boss for him to have like a bad first impression of me. Um, and also uh, my buddy was like, and on, like, honestly, if a sound design gig comes up, I think you'd be perfect. But like with, uh, with composition, it's just like a really hard thing to get into. Cause there are people that work like full time, like Hollywood status composers that do stuff for like TV shows and movies and they'll do composition for uh you know, video, these video games and they'll turn it around in like a day or two, you know? So that's what I was up against. And I was like, all right, I meant fair enough. And I, I, you know, I really appreciated the opportunity for him to like, or the opportunity that he gave me to even just send something to him. Yeah. But it was a cool learning, learning experience. I, um, felt like it matched the description. Um, you know, I, I listened to it and I'm like, man, I, I wonder if I just like ripped off of uh junkie XL. He's, he's the guy who, uh, who wrote, who wrote the, the score for Mad Max, but, uh, um, no, he, I'm he proud of it. simply your muse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm proud of it. And, um, yeah, you know, sometimes failures are good learning lessons. So, uh, that's kind of what I took away from it, but yeah, I remember, uh, I remember kind of walking through that whole experience with you and kind of living living that down and you know again nothing against your buddy <laughs> but I, yeah. I was I was really I was really pissed when, when because I know he was looking out for you in in the end but in my mind it was like you know you're not even gonna give him you know give him a chance to have your boss listening to this so to me that just really rubbed me the the wrong way but that is the hard thing about things like this where it's not it's not necessarily indicative of the quality of, of what you're 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 putting out but it's just sometimes with the arts you know how subjective they are it just might not be the exact vibe that they were looking for but um, I think you hit the nail on the head where it's like we learn from these quote failures um, and and the the big lesson that like I said before is the recurring theme is not letting that one thing, stop you, you know, where some people might give up right there and be like, well, I suck. It's over. I guess I'm not meant for this. Like being able to push through that and learn from that and realize that, you know, and not take it personally and realize that you are, you know, putting out quality work. It's just maybe not what they were looking for. Um, and then just moving on to the next thing and looking for that next opportunity. Yeah. And like I said, uh, earlier, I'm just really thankful that with this particular experience, I was able to like, just take it in stride and be like, Hey, this is a learning experience. It's not what they were looking for, but I'm really proud of it. And, um, uh, it, it really did provide a huge boost in terms of my confidence and when it comes to like, just writing, just trying to write something and not worrying about the end result, um, as far as like where it's going to get me mostly just like, am I satisfied with this? And if it is, if I'm satisfied with it, then that's good enough. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I think that shows a lot of uh, a lot of maturity, and um, it's it's really important. We need to show ourselves a, a lot of grace in those kinds of areas as as artists. Yeah, for sure. Um, f- for me, another kind of moving down the the line chronologically here throughout my career. 
getting ready for grad school, uh, sending in auditions, you would, uh, for the grad schools that I was auditioning for, you could send in uh, video auditions. And then if you pass that, they would invite you in for a, an in-person audition. And this one, we're going to get, we're going to get real here. We're going to get, uh, this is kind of embarrassing for me, but uh, we're going to power <laughs> through. Um, so I was actually at the time, you know, I didn't really have any experience filming videos or anything like that. So I had my dad helping me out. I went over to my parents' house. You know, we set up the camera, set up a whatever mic I had at the time, and just recorded through some of my pieces. And it just wasn't going well, um, at, at least to the extent that I, I wasn't happy with it. For the audition, you had to play. You couldn't, obviously, you couldn't cut and you know, splice things. It had to be one take. Um, no but, movie magic. That's right. Like, it had to be, <laughs> could, I couldn't cheat. Uh, and so, and, but I, but at the same time, since it was a recording and I had the opportunity to go back and f- do it again, even though it had to be one take, you could obviously do multiple takes. So I was being really picky about it and I wanted it to be absolutely perfect because this was the future of my career at stake. And so I was just really nitpicking everything and uh, we, we ended up taking a break and we went downstairs and we were kind of sitting in the room with my mom and you know how big of a deal this is for me. Uh, I like had this just like overwhelming emotion come over me and I literally just started crying. <laughs> As like a, <laughs> a 20 year old young man in front of my my dad, who I don't even know if I'd ever cried in front of my dad as, a, as an adult <laughs> at that point. And uh, I mean, you know this because you cried at yeah. my own wedding more than, <laughs> yeah, more dude, than I, I was, did. I was a disaster at your wedding. I don't know what came over me. Uh, Jeremiah is uh, a sensitive boy. Yeah, well, you know, I've grown less <laughs> sensitive over since then. I, I don't know if it was like, I need to, I need to man up. But uh, <laughs> you've, har- you've hardened life has hardened yeah. you. Yeah, but I, yeah, I remember during the ceremony, I was uh, I was a wreck, and you were yeah. like just not that way. And I was like, man, yeah, Nathan's uh, Nathan's got like- a heart of stone. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my wife's dismay. I know. Uh, yeah, but w- I I feel like maybe we flip flopped because now like becoming a father and everything, I feel like things hit me a little a little easier. But anyway. I digress. Um, but yeah, I was, so I was mortified. I was sitting here crying in front of my parents, especially, you know, my, my dad, it was, it was really embarrassing for me, but I just had this, it was kind of the culmination of all this self doubt, um, in my own abilities, this uncertainty of the future. And if I'm doing the right thing, uh, you know, this uncertainty of what I was doing with my life and, and all these things just came together to just this overwhelming emotion that I just couldn't stop. And, um, and I think that's, I wish I, I could have I been share, there, Nathan. I know. You know, you, I would have held you. <laughs> you could have walked me through it. You, <laughs> these emotions that I've never felt before that you, <laughs> you feel on a regular basis. I just held you in my arms. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh, but yeah, Rocked it was you to sleep. Um, poor little like, just poor go little to sleep, Nathan. Nathan, and you wake up and you'll you'll do a great you'll, you'll do a perfect better. take. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, um, but you know I, I share these things even though it's embarrassing. But I think a lot of people can to relate. You know, maybe not to that extent, but it's just endeavors like this, like with the guitar and music and and things that demand so much of you, and it's such a vulnerable pursuit in many ways you're really putting yourself out there um to be you know for your work to be judged by others for your performances to be judged by others to some capacity and you pour your blood sweat and tears into your craft honing it and to only feel like you're not you know meeting up to to whatever expectations you set for yourself or or you know, you feel like the world is set for you. I don't know. It's, it's a lot. And so, um, I think again, the, uh, the, with that, there's not necessarily, I don't think any, any lesson there as far as what I did to overcome, you know, I, I kind of sucked it up and stopped crying at some point, but, (laughs) but, (laughs) but, uh, and, and ended up, I ended up getting into grad school and, you know, I pulled it together. But again, that was just another opportunity where, 
uh, I could have chosen to throw in the towel or, you know, push through and uh, kind of persevere through it. And that really is that persistence and, you know, not giving up itness <laughs> is uh, <laughs> kind of the unsung hero of, of really of any pursuit. You know, the people who are able to stick with things consistently over time are the people who tend to win. Yeah, that's great advice. I'm going to take it. I'm, uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, gotta, I, I am actually really thankful that I'm doing this podcast with you, Nathan, because it is it is forcing me to work on my own stuff, uh, which is really cool. So, like, you know, the Mad Max Fury Road thing that I, or inspired piece that I put out, and then the uh, my own Tramachi projects. Uh, it's been it's been a good exercise as far as just like being persistent and just getting stuff out there. So, appreciate yeah. it, man. Oh man! Hopefully, nice. hopefully, it's inspiring to other people as well. Yeah, just conversations like this, it's uh, it's really refreshing too because a lot of what I do is so much just, it's just me. You know, I don't have, uh, I don't have a team of people that I work with and, and so you can really kind of get in my own head. Yeah. And so being able to just talk through some of these things is, uh, it's really therapeutic in a way. Yeah, dude, there's like, there was like this, it kind of reminds me of this project that I was assigned that I, I have a clip of as well. That was uh, pitched to me as like a lady who is homeless, who's kind of, she has a lot of like skeletons in her, in her closet and she's kind of lost her mind a little bit. And she finds this like cardboard box uh, robot in a dumpster. So it's, it's a robot made out of cardboard box. Right. And um, they asked me if I could do sound design for it. And it was like, meant to be you know they <laughs> the way that it was we when when I talked to the director about it it was like you know kind of like maybe R2D2 or Wally or something like that and um that's very intimidating right um yeah. so she when 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 the director told me about the project I was like yeah I'll, I'll do it but uh in my mind I was like Dude, I'm. Uh, this is this is really scary. I don't know what I'm going to do for this because uh, I'd never done anything like that before. I, I mean, I'd done like some sci-fi type sounding stuff, but um, nothing where I'm like supposed to bring life to a literally inanimate object because it's it's just a cardboard box that just sits there and it has like a face painted on it, um, right. and that's pretty much it. So uh, I got the project and. Uh, I uh, was delivered the final edit and I, and I watched the film and um, like this lady is like talking to this robot and there's no uh, like scripted dialogue necessary that she was supposed to be responding to. Um, and, and, and the robot would just be making no like gibberish noises. It wasn't going to be like words, but um, there was supposed to be a lot of things to it. So like uh, it's only like a 10 minute film, a short film. And like at the beginning of the film, the robot was supposed to be like a baby basically. And by the end of the film, it was supposed to be like more of an adult or like the, the ladies equal. So there was supposed to be an aspect of, of slow maturing over the course of the, of each scene. Oh, wow. And the, yeah. And uh, so anyway, it was really daunting. I was like, man, I don't know. But, but what was cool about it was that I had just had our, my first son Pax was born and uh, I had a lot of inspiration from the way that he cries um, for huh. like some of the earlier scenes. Um, so anyway, I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Um, here's a quick clip that I'll show you guys. And uh, just to give a like a background to the clip, the lady is uh, begging for stuff and she's talking to the robot and the robot's kind of like annoyed at her and uh, trying to get her to do something. So that's kind of what, it, what, what the scene was uh, going for. So you, here it is. They're trying to poison me. Tell you what, you shut up for five damn minutes and I will take you home. Yes, after I am done. Yes, I promise. Yes.
Yeah, so that's it. So I, I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Um, the the aim of the film, it was, you know, it, like I said, it centers around a homeless lady. And uh, the mix was supposed to sound kind of uh, gritty and earthy. And then obviously the sounds coming from the robot, like I said, it's like a cardboard box. So um, the way that it, the way that I was able to get it to to mix with the with the rest of the mix, <laughs> uh, it's a bad choice of words. Uh, no, to, to to blend in with the rest of the mix, um, I was pretty happy with how that uh, worked out. So um, yeah, I was pretty proud of it. The director, more importantly, the director was really happy with it. So uh, that was cool. And also the the writer of the script told me like, dude, I'm so. I was so happy with that. Like I thought it was just going to be like a couple bleeps and bloops and like you gave it like a voice. Like that's awesome. So I I was pretty happy with the the reception from them. So that was a cool daunting task, but uh, yeah, I feel like you went because that would have been my first, you know, instinct as well would be to think like, you know, especially if it's just going to be a cardboard box sitting there is to just kind of have some robotic sounds, but you really took it in stride and, and kind of went above and beyond and made something that also wasn't, derivative of of like r2d2 or or wally in the sense that it's still it it sounded unique like i feel like i haven't heard something that that sounded um exactly like that before and um which is really cool and to convey emotion and and into where it sounds like it's asking like questions with how the inflection in those tones and stuff is like really cool. And like the little, uh, like victory sound that you kind of like put at the end there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that was really, really creative. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, to your point where you said, um, it didn't sound derivative of all your R2D2. That was probably my, my biggest, uh, uh, I guess uh, that was my proudest moment with it is that it did feel like its own thing. And I was really worried that I was going to just sound like a ripoff. Um, and, and to me anyway, it it doesn't. So yeah, I was pretty, I was really happy with it. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. I would love to, it was, it was hard though. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like again, that would be another episode in and of itself to talk about like how that even, how you created that. Um, yeah, I'd be down. Yeah. Yeah. Really. That's really cool. Um, so for me, the next thing that I kind of had here was, starting the whole beyond the guitar pursuit and and the YouTube channel, one of the first big hurdles that I ran into was learning how to put out arrangements and new videos quickly. Um, You know, up until that point, you know, I would spend months working up a few pieces for a recital in, in college. And here I was, in the YouTube world where the expectation is to put out content really regularly to feed the algorithm and, and all these things. And, and so I had to learn how to really optimize my, my process, which of course, starting beyond the guitar, my process was, it was a brand new process. All these things that I was doing were all new to me. And so trying to put out a new arrangement and a new video, even every other week, was such a stretch at first. Um, And it it evolved to the point where I started putting out weekly videos at some point, you know, we had talked about that. Yeah. Um, And even though today I've backed out, back down from that to where I put out a new music video every other week again. uh, But I still essentially from start to finish, I make an arrangement and a music video in one week uh, because I, I reserve the off weeks for instructional content and things like that. So I still have managed to squeeze that whole process into a week. And so that was a huge challenge, learning how to optimize my arranging process. Um, and that's kind of what we talked about in, in last week's episode about the efficiency, the 80-20 principle and, and um constantly moving forward, whether I'm feeling inspired or not, um, and creating that inspiration, learned lots of things through that, um, the performance. So not only do I have to arrange it in a matter of days, I then have to learn how to play this complex piece of music and memorize it in a matter of days. Um, and that was when I realized that I could do it. And that goes back to kind of the Parkinson's law as well that we talked about last week it was kind of not putting limits on myself uh, was, was kind of an eye-opening experience because I, I had this 
self-imposed limitation, I guess, to where I thought there's no way that I can do this in a week. It's just, it just doesn't make sense to memorize like a piece that is complex enough that sometimes I would spend weeks at least, if not months, uh, trying to master in, in college, trying to boil that down to its you know, essence in the most efficient way seemed absurd to me. Um, and so just really learning how to master that efficiency was a big, steep learning curve in the beginning. Um, and it still sometimes can be daunting, especially I'll talk about this more later, but like my most recent arrangement, the uh, Ezio's family from Assassin's Creed, knocking that out in a week was, that was, that was rough. Yeah. You said you had a couple late nights doing that one. Uh, that man, that, that arrangement looks impossible to play. It, I watched it a few times and that little uh, lead melody that starts that you can hear in the beginning when you bring in like uh, the arpeggios and stuff, it sounds, it doesn't look like you're playing it, but I, if you look, I think right. at your like uh, ring finger, that's where you, I don't know. But anyway, it, it's pretty, pretty nuts. I was impressed. Yeah. Um, and this is, that's where, well, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is where I wish I could actually play some clips here, but uh, copyright reasons. Uh, we can't actually oh, yeah, play that's, that in that's, the podcast. That's, yeah, I should say uh, that's why we're playing some clips from me and not from Nathan. You all know Nathan's work, so uh, you're probably like, who yeah. is this guy? Jeremiah he doesn't know anything. So <laughs> that's why we're playing a few clips of my stuff that isn't copyright protected. <laughs> that's right. He gets he gets that uh, luxury. Uh, for me, you just look it up on YouTube. You'll be good. But uh, but yeah, that was one of the, uh, that that multiple the multiple voices going on in that arrangement all at once. I had that recurring just ascending melody that just repeated over and over that that melody was simple but then this counter melody comes in um and that was a moment in the arrangement where i knew i always talk about how arranging is a game of compromises where if you're taking something that's you know played with an orchestra or at the very least multiple instruments and you're trying to condense that all to be played on one guitar lots of times you have to compromise on what you include but there are certain things that are very iconic and essential to a theme that you don't want to leave out, right? And so with this Ezio's family, there's this really recognizable repeated melody that just repeats through the whole thing. And since it is so repetitive, when this counter melody comes in against that, that's a really important moment. And it's an opportunity to add some variety to it. And so I knew when I heard that, I knew that was going to be a beast to try to do it at the same time. But I knew that I had to do it uh, because that would be one of the things that would really take the arrangement to the next level. And so I had to wrestle with that for a while, figuring out what fingerings I could do to be able to play all these notes at the same time while keeping this bass line and kind of a accompanying arpeggio going. Um, so the arrangement aspect of that was really challenging. And then being able to physically play that, I drilled that with a metronome or using Guitar Pro Speed Trainer where it just, it speeds up in increments of like one BPM or you can do it by percentage, just like 1%. So I dropped it down to like 50% speed and had it on every repetition. It would just automatically loop that section and it would go up by 1% every time, speeding up so gradually. And I did that for hours. I had like two eight hour practice days. And um, that's insane. Yeah. Aren't you glad your patrons voted for that piece? Yeah, that was a patron voted one as well. So thank you for that <laughs> one, guys. <laughs> um, it paid off though, man. Seriously, it's really it was, good. Yeah, it was a rewarding, it was a rewarding challenge. And the final hurdle for that was it was even I was right down to the wire. And I I had actually had it recorded, but for the video, I still didn't have it memorized. Uh, cause I don't want to read off of a screen while on the video. I, I just don't like the way that that looks. Um, it's not as engaging of a performance. And so I still, I had one day left to really get it memorized. And it's this not, is not one as thing. A, not as engaging as when you're making eyes with your guitar. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Looking <laughs> as somebody commented, it's still one of my favorite comments. They were like, find somebody who looks at you like Nathan looks at his guitar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's true yeah that's right that's what everybody deserves that um 
So one thing that I've learned as part of that, to give you some insight into the process of what I've learned about, you know, mass, learning these things in just one week was, uh, as far as memory, really sleeping on something does so much. I never really realized that until I forced myself to try to memorize things so quickly. Um, so when I'd finished recording it, you know, that I think it was Thursday night, I, I was it just things like I could play it, but the memory just wasn't clicking yet. And I, I went to bed that night, woke up the next day and all those things that just weren't quite clicking all of a sudden had really cemented themselves a little bit more firmly in my memory. And I've seen that time and time again. And there is science to back that up as well, as far as the connections that we make when we're sleeping. And so that's really the power of like consistent practice, sleeping on it, hitting it again the next day. It's uh, it's really important. Yeah. The same goes for like composition stuff I find too. And even, even mixing, I'll like be having a, a, a late session or whatever, just writing something or mixing something. And by the end of it, I'm like lost in the forest. Like, you know, like, what is it? Like you can't see the, the forest through the trees or whatever. Right. And uh, so I usually will like stop at that point when I'm like, I don't know if this is good or not. And then I'll come back to it in the morning and have fresh ears. And it's like, I can really tell like, oh, this melody or whatever is terrible or it's really good actually. Or the mix is like, oh man, these things are too low or these things are too uh, loud or whatever. So yeah, sleep sleep is a uh, is magical, man. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's it's a uh, that's my superpower. That's, that, after that's all. why. That's why. Yeah, that's why you sleep so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's the key. It's the key to my. That's the secret sauce. <laughs> secret sauce. It's my secret that's sauce. That's like. Oh man, I wish I had a secret sauce. <laughs> you do. You're the Michelangelo. <laughs> You're the Michelangelo of our generation, as we learned <laughs> last uh, last week. Oh, dude, I, I wish. <laughs> but I, I have, I did have a, a recent challenge with mixing, though, and it's. Uh, um, do we want to get into that now? Yeah. Um. So yeah, basically, uh, I, I record or I, I mixed and mastered, and I also added some uh, some synth stuff to a uh, uh, ambient album that my my band uh, Junko did and it's just uh, right now it's myself and a buddy of mine his name is Andrew and he plays guitar um, and uh, loves ambient music so uh, we decided to put out a full ambient EP because we have like little ambient tracks on our other albums uh, but this is like just all ambient stuff so anyway one of the uh, or, or a lot of the tracks actually um, were recorded all on his uh, loop station on one mic so it was like uh, really muddy and noisy and uh, not super clear. And that and that's part of the, the aesthetic of the music as it is, but um, it was kind of my job to make sure that things sounded, um, you know, noisy in a good way and, you know, kind of clean. So it was really challenging for this one track. And uh, I'll play a clip of it uh, without any mixing, uh, and, and I just kind of uh, made the loudness levels similar so that it, one doesn't sound louder than the other. But this is without any mixing. So here we go. So that's without any mixing done. Uh, if you're listening on good headphones or good speakers, um, you'll be able to tell that the bass is really loud. Uh, there's a lot of noise. It's kind of hard to decipher between that and the uh, the guitars playing. Again, we wanted noise in there, but it felt a little bit overpowering. And also the mix just it, it, or the sound anyway just feels very congested, kind of like it's a you know in a in a, a closet full of clothes and it's like really tight and there's no air in the mix. So, uh, I, it was my job to kind of bring out the music in the, in the music. So this is, uh, what it sounded like after I mixed it. So 
So again, if you're hearing on a nice system, you'll be able to tell the the bass is much clearer. Um, the highs are more present and lush. Um, the noise is still there, but it's uh, it's a little less um, in your face. And also I did things like I did some um, uh, stereo widening so that the sound field was uh, more open. I gave some reverb and compression and uh, all, you know, all kinds of, we, like I said, we, we can talk about audio stuff in a different podcast, but um, I was really happy with how it turned out. And um, it was, uh, it wasn't anything that I had uh, really done before. Cause usually, you know, when you're recording and mixing, you have separate tracks for everything. And this was all just one big track. So I don't know. I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Yeah. That's man. Mixing and, and mastering and all that is still such a foreign art form to me. It's it's like equal parts art and science, you know. And it's uh, yeah, it's such a challenge in and of itself. And I'm really excited. That I mean, yeah, that sounds amazing. And I'm that's the first. That's actually the first sneak peek that I've even heard of that uh, that EP. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. By the time we release this podcast, it should be up online. Um, we submitted it uh, last week, I think. So it should be out, hopefully, um, by the time this podcast is out. But um, but yeah, I was pretty happy with it. The, and you, what you meant, what you said about um, uh, science and art, it's like yeah, the audio is uh, is very uh, scientific, and it's uh, it's interesting stuff. But it's it's if you don't know the science behind it. Um, which can be kind of a slog to learn. Um, there are things, there are things that you won't know that will, uh, kind of hamper your mixes and stuff. So anyway, I, I recommend if people are interested in that, you got to learn the, the science behind the audio, what, what goes on with audio in your ears, in the, in, uh, acoustic spaces and, you know, digital platforms versus analog platforms, all that stuff. But Anyway, like I said, we can talk about that later. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot that goes into <laughs> it's it. But it's yeah, it's it's yeah. it's good stuff, uh, and it's very important for anybody who's trying to make music and put it out into the world. Um, but yeah, you guys heard it here. Make sure you're looking up Junko and the Corona Ambient EP. Um, I'm excited to listen for it. It'll probably it'll give you a taste of what it's like to be in my world where you can fall into a deep relaxed sleep at any any given moment that's <laughs> yeah. the that's the goal here i think right <laughs> it's gonna lull you into yeah. a sense of of uh pure relaxation um oh and i should say i should say one thing about junko too so when my buddy andrew first came up with the project that's the that was the name he chose and it's a type of bird in case anyone doesn't know what it is but when he decided on that name he looked up uh you know the name online and looked for bands and stuff and he couldn't find anything right so he decided on that name, and then we put out our first album uh, after he asked me to join the project, uh, which is called At the End of It. And uh, pretty much around the time that we released that, there's this Spanish like pop guitar singer dude that uh, you know, kind of in the vein of like Gypsy Kings or that kind of thing, who like suddenly listed like twenty albums that go back to like 1980s or whatever. <laughs> And it's and his name is Junco, oh, but it's no. spelled the same way, J U N C O. <laughs> so so you might find this uh, this Spanish dude uh, on online when you're looking for us. And the other the other thing is there's another band that came out like maybe a little bit after uh, our first album from like Seattle or something, and their band is also named Junco. So it sucks, <laughs> but that's the way it is. Who, when, these, when, when, who do these people <laughs> think they are? Where do they know, where do they imposters. get off? Oh man. <laughs> well, we're going a little bit long here tonight, but this is good stuff. So, you know, if you're uh, if you're still with us, you know, grab yourself a nice little beverage, kick back, relax cuz uh, I want to keep I want to keep rolling with this for a little bit cuz I've got uh, I got a few more things here that that I want to share at least. Um a, a big there was another big kind of decision point when I first was starting out with Beyond the Guitar, and uh, Jeremiah was was definitely with me through through this experience as well. Um, so when I first started, I wanted to release 
my arrangements in the form of tabs and sheet music, uh, but I wanted to make sure I was doing it the right way. Getting Since these are arrangements, uh, the, the copyright around that means that in order to distribute that, uh, the tabs and the sheet music. I don't own the rights to it, so you need the permission of the copyright holders. It's a whole long thing we won't go into, um, but there aren't very many good systems in place to be able to do that. It's really hard to reach out to a lot of these publishers. And so back with my Ancient Stones arrangement for, uh, for Skyrim, in the early days of my channel, I was, I was making progress working with a, a, the publisher that... Um, had the the rights for that and they used a middleman to kind of handle this who who shall remain nameless <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, they it was it was a horrible experience this was one of, to this day it's one of the worst experiences in the music industry that I've, I've ever had um, basically they kind of jerked me around for a long time um, giving me empty promises about when it could be released. Um, you know, they were taking a big cut just as just being a middleman. Um, they, they kept messing things up. Uh, I kept having to delay the video. Um, I, <laughs> so at the end of it, I had navigated one of these uh, agreements before directly with a publisher. So I thought, you know, I don't need these middlemen. I, I know how this works. So I reached out to the publisher myself and kind of went over the, the, this company's head and said, can we just cut them out? They're, they're kind of messing things up. They're drawing this out. Can we just work this out directly between us? And, uh, they came back to me and they said, well, you know, we actually have a contract with them, so we can't do that. And the, uh, the president of this middleman company obviously heard that I tried to go over their head and he sends me this nasty email, basically like his language was just like schoolyard bully uh, talk like threatening, uh, you know, this is what happened to the last people who crossed us and spoke ill of us and gave me this website where you go to the website and there's like a pop-up that automatically comes up like a pop-up of shame that says, I, I apologize for wrongfully accusing this company of X, Y, and Z. <laughs> and, uh, oh you know, gosh. again, threatened to sue me <laughs> said, you'll never be able to publish this video. I think, I think it I think it was like a huge eye opener for, I mean, for you especially, but like you said, we, we were talking about it as this was happening uh, of how small the industry is. Cause like, I'm sure you had no idea that like this, co this, uh, the, you know, the publishing company was going to like rat on you basically. Right. Yeah, and tell them like, Hey man, this guy's trying to go over your guys' head. And it's like, dude. Yeah. I didn't expect that. And it was devastating for me because here I am, trying to do the right thing. I wanted to make sure that the copyright holders got their cut of the sales. Um, I was trying to do everything above board when most people to this day in, in my field, nothing against them, you know, to each their own, but most people to this day don't pursue uh, kind of the, the getting, securing these copyright uh, licenses the right way. You know, they'll just put out their, their tabs or their sheet music on their own, um, without securing any type of licenses. And again, that's on them. No, no judgments. You kind of, you do what, what you feel right is right for you. But for me, I wanted to do it uh, above board, do it the right way. So here I am trying to pay these people and I was getting threatened and, I, you know, I thought I'm never going to be able to put this video out. So I basically had to humble myself and apologize to this guy um, for offending him so so clearly. And I tried to make good with it. And so he, he, he was really happy about the apology. And he's like, we're going to make this work. Then they proceeded to continue to jerk me around for another like two weeks. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to release the... Uh, the sheet music or tabs for this. I'm just going to put out the video and I cut ties with them. And that was that, but that at, in the middle of that, that was like a, about a month long endeavor where I thought if this is the fight that I'm going to have to do for every single video, it's not worth it. And I, I, I just must not be meant to, to do this whole beyond the guitar thing. And I really struggled with that. And I had many moments in there where I wanted to give up. And 
Uh, so again, that recurring thing of, of pushing through that. Now I'm very fortunate to have partnered with Music Notes, who does all that work for me. And they handle that. And they've been such a great partner. Um, and I've it, it was so rewarding for me. To, <laughs> the moment that Music Notes published that specific arrangement <laughs> was one of the highlights. I feel like the biggest victories of my career because I felt like I was finally able to come full circle and kind of stick it to the <laughs> to this company that tried to <laughs> tried to screw me over. Um, oh man, I I remember how I remember how discouraged you were, and I was like, man, Nathan, don't don't give up. You're so close because I I remember um, you know things were slowly ramping up with your channel and everything. Yeah. And I was like, just don't, don't give up yet. And, uh, and I remember eventually when you got the music notes uh, thing worked out, how like relieved and like, I felt like this huge weight had been lifted from your shoulders. It was pretty, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. It, it was a long, it was a long road to get there. Um, but, but yeah, uh, that was one of many, moments you know kind of darker moments that you've walked me through a, a lot of which have also been related to this kind of next piece where it's just um a lot of the challenges that i've had to overcome related to beyond the guitar and and just just putting music out into the world in general is just disappointments uh related to things like you know videos not getting the views are not performing the way that you you hope they would, and um, this is a tough thing that really any musician or artist is going to face at some point. Where you pour your heart and your soul into a project that's really near and dear to your heart, and it just maybe doesn't pan out the way that you hoped it would. Um, and that's actually a question I always ask anytime I have a chance to meet. Uh, an artist or a musician or a composer who I really admire, one of the things that I always ask them is um, I ask them like what their favorite project that they did or favorite song they composed or, or you know favorite tune they arranged that didn't get the attention that they had hoped. And everybody instantly has an answer for that because it is something that's just, you know, we all face it in some capacity. Um, so, and like I said, Jeremiah has been kind of one of my, he's been one of my sources for, for venting when, when things like that happen to where something doesn't pan out the way that I hoped it would. Uh, he's kind of been my sounding board to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, encourage me and, uh, and walk me through that. So I definitely appreciate, I appreciate that. And it's something that I have, I've improved a lot on over time. Uh, it's something that of course I'm still, still working on anybody in the content creation world is, is always in that, that mental battle of, um, of, of trying not to obsess over those kind of things. One thing with that, Nathan, is that I, I, I stumbled on this guy's YouTube channel who, he, he was on Reddit or something. And, uh, he like rapped, um, Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. <laughs> right. And it like blew up. Have you seen it? Uh, no. Okay, so so it's a Dr. Seuss, but he but he like put it put it to like a couple of hip hop uh beats and um it like blew up and now he's like putting out all kinds of different like rapping things to different Dr. Seuss books. And uh I looked at his at his previous videos in uh, on his channel and they're totally unrelated. So I was just thinking like, man, I wonder if this guy is bummed that like this random rapping video, uh, you know, blew up when like he has all this other serious stuff on his channel. And now he's just like doing that right. to try and make things work, I guess. I don't know. But yeah. I wonder if, if if he's, you know, struggling with the fact that like this, <laughs> this one thing that he didn't probably <laughs> didn't think was going to blow up, blew up. Right. He like wants to be a serious rap artist and now he's like forced to just rap about Dr. Seuss. <laughs> well, that, or like, I think he has like random, like documentary stuff on there, like serious, uh, like gotcha. stuff, you know? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's, a, anyway. and I think there's a lot of, a lot of content creators come into those, those moments where they have to kind of choose if, if they do have something that really takes off, that might not be true to what they are really passionate about. They kind of have to navigate how deep they're going to go down that road um, or if they're going to 
you know, ideally you find that sweet spot where it's kind of a mix. Uh, but I definitely, yeah. I, I know firsthand of some people who've had to compromise for the sake of, of making a career. They have certain things that pop where they might be serious musicians, but they go down this kind of comedy route because that gets the views. Um, and you know, it's like for me with the Fortnite videos, um, yeah. I was, I could have really doubled down on that and just become kind of some Fortnite guitar channel or something. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And seriously. And honestly, that's something that I, I do give you props for. Cause like, yeah, it could have been, that could have been the easy way out and it probably could have been guaranteed YouTube money, but up to a certain point, like it's kind of like long, like looking at it in the long term, like right. once Fortnite dies, are you just going to like die with it, you know? And so yeah. I feel like you you've put really, all your uh, eggs in that basket. Yeah. Like you've stayed the course and chosen to be a little more long. I feel like a more long lasting, uh, you know, product or right. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Those, you know, chasing those viral things, it can be really, it can be really fleeting. Um, and I think you get a lot of eyes, but it's kind of like what we talked about in, in the nostalgia episode. It's, you don't really necessarily get the diehards that are going to be with you for the, the for the long term. Um, right. But one thing that I learned with that, and this is a really, I think, a really hard thing for, for us as musicians to learn to not be biased about our own projects and to think that just because we're passionate about it and just because we put so much effort into it and think we did a great job with it doesn't mean that we're entitled to anybody's attention or anybody's love for that project. Um, yeah. And, and that's hard. It's hard to separate ourselves from that. Um, and I think so often, especially people that are new to the game, I can speak from experience. I would put something out there and I think, of course, people are going to love this because, you know, I love it. I put a lot of work into it. I'm proud of the quality of it. Um, but we have to understand that, you know, the, there's a million things vying for people's attention and nobody owes us their attention. You have to earn it and you have to understand, you know, that sometimes something's not going to strike a chord with somebody and you have to not take that personally. Um, and you have to learn to work through that and improve. Yeah. And that's been the biggest hurdle for me as far as like whether or not it's, it's quote unquote worth producing music because in my mind I'm like well no one's even going to care like if I never made another song or track or whatever uh, no one would care right so in my mind it's like well if no one cares then why should I bother but that's where you know I mentioned this a uh, couple podcasts ago that like I need to do this for myself because I love music and I love making music and I owe it to myself to make music for myself right. and I shouldn't expect other people to care uh, if they do, that's awesome. Um, obviously, I, I would like them to, but like, I can't. I can't expect them to, and I can't get my feelings hurt if like it gets like ten views on YouTube or ten plays on Spotify or whatever. Right? Yeah. I mean, you have to do it for yourself first and foremost. But then there's nothing wrong with with wanting people to care about your work. But you do. You have to earn it, right? And that, I think that's something yeah. that we take for granted. Um, you know, especially as you know as as millennials, we're famous for our sense of entitlement, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and I, I do think it's something that we really do struggle with in many areas. You know, we feel like we're owed certain things. And so, yeah, learning not to take that personally and, and to continue that perseverance again, that consistency over time, if you're putting out quality stuff, you will earn that from, from people. Um, I also have learned to focus less on... Uh, this is something that Tim Ferriss, uh, I'm a big fan of, of his, his writing and, uh, his books and uh, just, who's that? I don't know who that is. He's the, we've talked about the, the four hour work week. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Among other things, he's got a real big pod podcast and blog. Um, but he calls these vanity metrics where it's the metrics that we look at, on social media, like likes and comments and, and things that, 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 that feed our vanity and our ego, um, <laughs> but don't always push the needle forward in our businesses. Um, so it's things that yeah. we can obsess over, but they aren't necessarily the really key metrics that we need to look at that indicate, you know, if we're, if we're 
you know, being quote successful or, or not. Um, and my, my wife knows this all too well. You know, I can, again, I'm getting better at this, but especially back, you know, back in the day, I could have a, a slow month of poor performing videos where nothing seems to be really hitting. Um, but my income could literally be the same. It couldn't be affected at all by that slow month. Everything else could be totally fine. And I still managed to convince myself that my career is over. <laughs> right. And so it's, <laughs> it's obsessing over those things that yes, views are important and they do trickle into other metrics that are, um, that, that do contribute to, to your business's performance and, and your, your, your career as a musician. Um, but they aren't the end all be all in and of themselves. So vanity metrics and not obsessing over those, that was a really big, big thing for me. And it's a, a discipline that I constantly am, am working on, you know, turning, turning off, caring about those as much. Yeah. I don't, I don't have an issue with vanity metrics cause, um, I don't have any, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm good, man. That's right. That's right. You get that, you get those little likes start trickling in and then it's a, I know. it's, it's oh, a no, dangerous, man. it's a dangerous, dangerous world. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm cool with just, you know, having, I can send you music. I can send my wife music, my mom, you know, that's right. My grandparents are all dead, so I can't send it to them. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Getting everybody, morbid. send send my boy Jeremiah some vanity metrics so he can uh, so he can relate to. No, my no, problems. I don't. I don't. No, no, but I don't. Want, I don't want a big head. <laughs> I don't want people to listen to my music. Oh my gosh! And so uh, another thing, uh, kind of to to wrap up that that side of, it, of how I've kind of learned to deal with these disappointments is. Uh, I've, I've realized that I have this really big underlying um, caring about others' expectations. Um, so every time, and this is ridiculous, this is why it's good to talk through these things because I know that there are a lot of other um, creators out there who can relate to this. Um, but when we, when we kind of talk through it, it really does sound ridiculous. But I have this nagging voice in the back of my head when a video doesn't really perform well, I can kind of imagine a, you know, 12 year old Fortnite fanboy like commenting <laughs> on my channel, like, Oh, your, your channel's dying. You know, you're, you're nothing without Fortnite or something like that. <laughs> like I have that, that voice that starts to creep in. And that's, I mean, that's literally never long nails. That's right. So, I mean that nobody has ever said that, but I have that, it's that like that, thought process about, uh, you know, thinking of other people's expectations and what, what my channel should be doing or my own comparisons that my channel should be getting this many views based on, you know, because this person is getting this many views and, you know, there's no rule book on this stuff. And, uh, but we just naturally put these expectations on ourselves, um, just be, based on what we're observing from other people. Um, but again, a lot of that boils down to kind of some of those vanity metrics where um, you don't see the inner workings of, of other people's careers and, and how it's all playing out. You just see the, the external side of things. And so it's really not fair to compare yourself on that level. Um, and it's just really important to focus on the things that you can control um, and so really, yeah, obsessing over, over things like views and what other people think about the, the performance of, of my channel and things like that. It's, it's been really help. It's been really good for my own kind of mental health to stop caring about that as much. Um, and I have seen myself grow in that area over time. Um, and you've probably seen that as well. I call you less and less, uh, lamenting over, you know, different failed you know per se <laughs> projects yeah the I, i'm gonna have to uh disconnect the uh beyond the guitar insecurity hotline because um <laughs> it's yeah it's yeah it's not you're not on not call around the anymore. clock anymore yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so so that's that's progress it is progress definitely um but but again i share all this stuff because I, I like to be transparent in this because it is something that i know for a fact a lot of people struggle with these same thoughts. And so um, 
for me, it's helpful to know that I'm not alone in those thoughts. Um, and for me starting out, you know, if I was to go back five years, um, to, to hear from somebody else that was further down the road than me, that it's a, you know, it's all, it's a work in progress and, um, things do get better and you, you learn how to mentally deal with these things over time. That would be really encouraging for me back then. Uh, and so that's why I really like to kind of just talk through some of these things. Yeah. It's super helpful, man. I mean, I, I, you even listen to like quote unquote celebrities or, or, uh, you know, actors talk or musicians and, and they all talk about how they're all most, mostly anyway, like they're all super insecure and they're all like, they struggle with whether or not what they, they, uh, produce is any good. And right. so, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely comforting to hear from other people that, you know, everyone struggles with this stuff and hopefully, uh, you can just like work through it. Yeah. And it's, like I said, it's really rewarding to kind of look back when I was thinking about all these things, even though we're all works in progress, it's cool to think back on, on things that we have overcome, uh, by persevering and, and sticking with it. Um, to look back five years ago, the, the type of musician I was and the type of entrepreneur I was and the type of um, just content creator I was, I was a very different person than who I am today. And I hope that in, you know, five years, I'll be able to look back again and say, you know, I'm a very different person than I was now. Yeah. And even just like the, the stuff that I used to mix for you back in the day, because now, now you're pretty much, uh, you're on your own, my young Padawan, you know, mixing your own <laughs> stuff. Uh, <laughs> but like the stuff that I used to mix for you back in the day, I, I listen to it now. And I'm like, oh man, I, I didn't do that great of a job. Um, so yeah, even, even little things like that. I hear obviously with the, the bigger projects that I've had, like with commercials and all, all you know, like this, like the short films stuff, um, I can definitely see improvement and that's, that's super encouraging. Uh, cause, um, yeah, the, the insecurity doesn't necessarily always go away, but, um, the fact that you can see progress is, a definitely confidence right. booster. Yeah. Um, so I guess for me, I don't know if you had any other points you wanted to hit, but um, I was going to kind of wrap up with just three quick little kind of fun bonus challenges that I've kind of run into just with specific arrangements over the years. Um, I did, back when I did the Daredevil theme, uh, I played it again as part of the Defenders medley video that I did where I, where I had these little you know, cosplays and I, I kind of dressed up in their costumes. Yeah. Um, I was back, back when I used to do that kind of thing. I, uh, (laughs) gotten, I've gotten lazy on that. (laughs) You were trying to, you were trying to figure out what gimmick would work. (laughs) Right. Exactly. It had to to actually, but you know, what's funny. Pax is like really for all of a sudden really into your Darth Vader, uh, cantina song (laughs) where you wear the Darth Vader mask and he loves the, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, nice. so he'll like ask me daddy can i watch the uh, uncle nathan playing the, the with the helmet and then after <laughs> when that's done he's like i want to watch uncle nathan uh, playing in green and i was like okay <laughs> uh, that's i love that <laughs> yeah i love that yeah those uh they all presented their own unique uh <laughs> unique challenges actually the funny thing behind that darth vader mask was we actually had one of those chewbacca masks that was like that went viral back back in the day oh, with yeah. that like lady on Facebook that was laughing with the mask on. We had one of those, <laughs> but my, my daggone head was too big. It wouldn't fit my, it was like a one size fits all <laughs> thing and it wouldn't fit on my head. So I had to go out and buy this like cheapo Darth Vader mask thing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah. Uh, I feel it's, like Chewbacca it's a, has a giant head. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh it's, it's something I live with. You know? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it is what it is. Big head. Yeah. Um, but with the, with the daredevil theme. So, uh, I, I put, I basically just put a, I don't remember, I guess that's what he did. I don't know if, I guess he had a beanie draped over his head or I don't know if that's the, or that was, he had his, maybe he had his like black, um, little bandana thing over his eyes. Anyway, my version of it was I basically just pulled a long beanie down over my face and I had to (laughs) hit those artificial harmonics that I do at the beginning of that arrangement uh, blind basically, which was really, 
really tough because those artificial harmonics, not only are you having to be accurate in the left hand, but you have to hit the correct frets with your right hand. And it's a pretty quick, like, ba -da 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 -da. it happens really yeah. fast. And so I wasn't even into your inner daredevil, man. Yeah, exactly. I had to channel. I was, I was seeing, seeing with my ears. Um, but <laughs> I didn't even the realize fretboard through the sound waves. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even realize until like I had already hit play and I was about to start and I was like, Oh shoot, I can't see what I'm doing. Like I was <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't even like think about it beforehand. And, uh, so needless to say that took a few takes, but there's one little bonus challenge that, uh, you know, we made it through. And then the Jurassic park video that I did where I dressed up in the, uh, the dinosaur, costume and walked around uh walked around richmond um i wasn't prepared for the challenge of um the added distractions that come with trying to play a piece of music that you just memorized uh while people are like staring at you and laughing at you <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and while you're like walking and there's all kinds of noise and people are pulling out their you know their phones and stuff like the first while the first hour of <laughs> while, while you're staring dramatically into the distance <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> that was a, that was that was a brilliant video but uh yeah it was like the first hour of footage was like a waste basically because I kept like having memory slips left and right and <laughs> until I was able to finally like dial in my focus and like stop caring about what was going on around me. Um, but that was a, uh, that was a fun challenge. And then, uh, it just last, lastly here, I was thinking back on the, the raise theme that we did that looked like we were filming out in, in the desert. Oh yeah. That one's, that one's awesome. Yeah, that was really fun. But that one, uh, we filmed it in the middle of December. So it was supposed to be in the desert. But if you look closely at my hands, you can see that they're like purple as I was freezing. <laughs> and so I was trying to play this oh, tune, man. which is actually, you know, it's kind of a quick, there's some quick moments in there. And my hands were literally ice. And we were filming for like five hours getting different shots. And we wanted like a sunset shot so we could get those that that binary sunset yeah that he that he put in it was a really cool shot um but my hands man they were they were ice and so i was of course i was playing along with the pre-recorded audio uh but i shudder at the thought of what the raw audio from those from the actual camera sounded like because <laughs> like, it was i'm sure it was just like at that point i was really just doing everything i could to just keep up with my my audio to just make it look realistic because my hands were just blocks of frozen ice Dude, I, I just, I hate, I hate being filmed, man. Cause like, uh, we did a music video for a band I was in college and like, I remember filming that and like, we, there's a part where we had gang vocals and we had to like, we were like each doing a, a shot where we were screaming in the, at the camera basically. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I just felt so stupid cause <laughs> like I, I'm just not a naturally like expressive person when I talk or, you know, whatever, uh, I'm not like, you know, I've never went to like any drama classes or anything. So right. I felt so out of place. So <laughs> yeah. man, I, I don't envy you in that regard. I know it takes, it's been a big learning curve, especially with the instructional videos. Um, again, this will have to be a subject for another day or I'm thinking about making a YouTube video where I react to my old videos. Um, cause I looked <laughs> back at my, my force theme tutorial is like the th maybe third video on my channel. Oh, that one is hilarious, dude. Oh my so goodness. I didn't say anything. I, I think we've talked about it since, but when he first put it out, I didn't say anything. <laughs> but I was like, this is the funniest thing that Nathan has done. Cause it was like, okay, so what you want to do is grab your <laughs> guitar and Put your finger on the fourth fret on the G string and both. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like, my eyes were dull, like dead eyes. Oh, oh man. I looked like I hated my life and I was so <laughs> bored with what I was doing. And the crazy thing is I thought I was being enthusiastic. And <laughs> it's like, if you, oh my goodness. So oh, I definitely dude. recommend again, if anybody needs an ego boost, go find my force theme <laughs> tutorial. It's like one of my first videos on, on the beyond the guitar YouTube channel. Oh, and, man. uh, and oh man, uh, talk about, <laughs> talk about learning as you go. Like I can kind of compare my recent instructional videos with that. And it's, uh, 
Oof, I'm, I'm so glad that I've learned over time how to be a little bit more animated in front of the camera. <laughs> oh man, I forgot about that video. It's so freaking funny. Oh, well, and so that's, bad. and that's actually, that's the funny on the flip side of that. I, I know you personally, right? And so when I watch your more animated stuff, I'm like, oh wow, this isn't like Nathan at all. <laughs> you know, this is, <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. Yeah. Um, yeah Cause you're way more like, a little bit. you're way more deadpan in real life. Yeah. But, oh man, it's funny. Yeah, but nobody wants oh, to see so that. So funny. No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. The force theme tutorial is much more accurate to. to, <laughs> to uh, sadly, <laughs> to, I hate to, to say it. I hate to say it, but that's a lot more accurate to <laughs> my actual personality. Uh, but anyway, um, I think that's a, a good place to to uh, wrap it up. Um, thank you for listening. I know we went a little bit long here, but it's it's. Uh, Hopefully you got some, some encouragement out of, out of these challenges that we've had to overcome and, and some fun with these stories. As always, you can find me on YouTube at Beyond the Guitar um, and anywhere social media, Beyond the Guitar. If you want to learn how to make your own classical or fingerstyle guitar arrangements, you can go to my website, beyondtheguitar.com, uh, to take my free training, Fretboard Freedom, to get started. And uh, Jeremiah, where can everybody find you? You can uh, look up Chomachi, C-H-O-M-A-C-H-I. Um, I have a single out. It's called Beacon. I say this every week, so I sound like a broken record. But uh, yeah, and then um, uh, my band Junko just put out uh, an ambient EP called uh, Corona Ambient. <laughs> um, and uh, it should be out by the time this podcast is out, hopefully. Because the last time I thought it would be out, by the time last week's podcast was released and it wasn't. So anyway, hopefully it's out, um, but uh, you can look out for that. And then if you feel like checking out the uh, the little like Mad Max Fury Road inspired thing I put out, um, you can just look it up on YouTube. I didn't, I didn't release it officially. I just put it up on YouTube just because it's easy and I don't have to pay money for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you can look up uh, Jeremiah Diaz and the track is called Fury. So if you just search for all of that, it should come up. Awesome. And if you have any ideas uh, for topics that you would like to hear us uh, talk about in future episodes, um, feel free to uh, hit me up on Instagram at Beyond the Guitar. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for, for listening. We will see you in a, another episode next week. As always, much love, and we'll see you then. <laughs>